Well, there has to be a willingness to, to try to figure things out or make your world better. There has to be that willingness first for anything. But once you have that, like this is a, a really wonderful time to be doing those kinds of searches because you have unlimited access to a lot of different places. And I would say within the last five years, maybe even 10 years, there are more groups that are male focused, that are about providing these safe spaces. Welcome to Connecting the Dots. I'm your host, Jessica Carice, and this space is a place where we talk about seemingly random topics, but in all actuality, they're connected together. And today we have a very special guest. Her name is Kathy Imabayashi. She has dedicated her career to positively impacting the lives of children, parents, and educators around the world. So Kathy, thank you so much, so much for being on my show. And tell us, where are you right now? Well, I'm in Japan. So thank you for making this possible. Yeah, thank you. You know, we, we connected on Facebook uh, and I'm, I'm so happy that you commented on my post and I uh, saw what you advocate for and your mission and your purpose around education and parenting for, um, you know, sons and males around the world and how they're, you know, they matter too and uh, how we treat them impacts their mental health and everything like that. So tell me more about like your, your purpose, what you're advocating for, why you got into it and share more of your day-to-day of what that looks like. Well, four years ago, I retired. And um, although I had done a lot of work within my uh, career to advocate for boys and understanding them in the educational realm, it was uh, four years ago that I finally had the time to totally uh, get into being a coach for parents raising boys, um, putting together materials that could help a parent when they're struggling or help an educator, anybody who's working directly with with boys. My focus is on the younger boys, but a male is a male, you know, from the minute they're conceived to to the minute that they're not here. So it really, there's a wide range. Um, Yeah. What was the second part of the question? (laughs) What does your day to day look like? Oh, it's full. It's, it's, uh, if this wasn't so much passion driven. I don't know that I could keep up the pace for this long, but um, I get up early because but as soon as I wake up, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, how can, wh- what can I do that's going to make it a better world for boys? Like what, what is it I can do? So um, the, the day is usually connected with helping me find ways to spread the word. So whether it's creating things for social media, if it's uh, sharing more about the courses, um, I just finished up a book. So that used to take quite a lot of my time. Um, Just always looking to connect with people who also are not necessarily like-minded, but open-minded and um, figuring that, you know, kind of the, the concept of being a lighthouse and the people who need to find you will find you. So I keep trying to shine the light. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And it's so funny that you you say that because that's kind of like a, a theme that actually just started developing organically on my podcast where, you know, people are finding their light and being that light and impacting other people's lives. So so we had our chance connection on Facebook. I usually never post on Facebook, so I'm so happy oh, that wow. I did because it's it's this is like an example of that. Absolutely, yeah. So, how did you end up in Japan? <laughs> oh well, uh, in my uh, I was just turning thirty actually, and I had grown up on the east coast of Canada. And I basically worked my way across to the West Coast. And um, after that, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do next, like I'd run out of country. And at that particular time, I read a book and I just I picked it up at a secondhand shop and um, it spoke to me like no other book has ever spoken to me. And within three months, I packed up all my belongings, sold anything else, got a job in Japan and moved here. So it was because I read a book. 
Wow. What was the name of the book? It was James Clavell's Shogun. And although he's a brilliant author and, and I love all of his books, it wasn't the book. Um, it, it was something about the book and it just, it opened a door and I trusted my instincts and, uh, and it was definitely the right, the right path to take. Mm -hmm. So in, in Canada, you are an educator, right? Yes, I started out in public school and then I went into daycare, which I absolutely loved working with the littlest ones. Oh, okay. And so when you were in, edu in education, is that what started um, developing your inkling that you want to start focusing on how the young or young boys or boys are being raised? Or I guess what kind of lit that fire? No, it wasn't a, an intentional um, part of what I was doing, working with children. And I worked with children a long time before this became my, my passion. But I'd always been drawn to the little boys. I loved their energy and, and their purity. And uh, I, I just, I really clicked with them. So they were a special part of my, my career. But I, I didn't understand, I didn't know what I didn't know at that time. And then when I um, gave birth to a boy, that opened up a whole new world to me because uh, I had grown up in a predominantly female household and I really didn't know what that really meant. And I think that gave me a great opportunity to, you know, to watch this little human being uh, develop. When he was about uh, three or four years old, that's when it changed for me. Up until that point, you know, like most parents, I, you know, read the books and, and tried to understand about raising children so I could do the best job that I could. Um, I also thought that I kind of had an upper hand on things because I was an older mom giving birth to begin with. And I'd had, you know, a, you know years and years, at least uh, 10, 15 years in education. So I thought I kind of knew, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit about uh, raising children. And when he was uh, three or four, at that time, I was teaching upper elementary. And on a Saturday, I took him um, fishing. He wanted to go fishing. His dad was working. So the two of us went down to a little creek that was a little bit off the road, but not, not a lot, not really, really isolated, but a little bit. But it was Japan, and I had no um, worries about safety. After we'd been down there for a little bit, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, and coming down this treed uh, pathway was uh, a group of boys. And in that particular moment, something happened that was so deep and so instinctive and so guttural, and I was totally filled with fear. And it was like, oh, there's a gang coming down. How am I going to protect my little boy and myself? That was my first reaction with no thought whatsoever. Anyway, these uh, young boys came down and, and the ironic thing is that they were the same age group that I had taught that, that previous year. And this is the summer in between elementary and middle school. So, you know, the boys' bodies usually just grow like, you know, wild seeds. And so I, you know, I should have recognized very quickly, their bodies are bigger, but there's still these little boys inside. Um, we ended up having a wonderful time. There was absolutely no need for any fear at all. And that could have been the end of it. But I'm very analytical to a fault. And I will dig something over and over and over in my head to try to make sense of it. Because when it makes sense to me, then it's easy. And if it doesn't make sense, it's, it's like a, a, an itch that I, I can't quite let go. And I try to find the logic behind that fear, behind that like really automatic response. And I couldn't. Like I had nothing in my own history that, you know, would have triggered that emotion. I, it, it didn't make sense. And then I had a thought and it was that thought that started everything for me. And the thought was, okay, my little guy's, you know, four now. So in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years is another woman 
going to be filled with absolute fear when she looks at my son, not because what he's doing, simply because he was born a male. And that thought was like, you know, something's wrong with this picture. And I'm going to find out, you know, what's at the bottom of this. And I'm going to do my best to prepare my son for this world and understand it. And I'm going to understand it. And, and that's how it all started. Wow. Wow. There's like so much packed in that story. Like, first, I love how you... Uh, caught that you had that deep gut fear because most of the time people are like oh it's my gut it's right like 100 percent." yeah and you allowed yourself to explore that fear essentially mm -hmm. and saw how things would play out and saw that your fear was not true and right. you were aware that your fear is not true yeah so how did you even develop that sense of awareness within you where you know that, okay, this is something I need to question and look into and understand? I've always been quite intuitive. And um, I understand now that I would be classified. I would have the character trait of being a highly sensitive person. And so I think it's just my makeup. Like I, I feel things, I sense things and, and I'm very analytical. So it just was kind of the whole package that was the perfect uh, ground for it, for this to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm, it's so funny. Cause I, I, I uh, classify myself the same way as analytical. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. So like, um, even with work, you know, I did a lot of like business analyst work and looking into problems and solving problems, you know, so it, it's so, still so funny, like how we even came across each other, because I'm seeing like similarities in how you're describing yourself and myself as well. So, you know, that that's amazing. And, and then, so that moment where you had the thought, like, in 15, 10, 15 years, I don't want people feeling scared, you know, when they see my son. That's, it's so interesting because, so coming from my, my side, I'm a black woman, I come from a black family and my brother is a black man. So in the US, there's a lot of that unconscious bias where people are scared. Yeah of black men automatically. Yeah. Yeah. And so my mom would tell my brother, like, just be careful. Cause this is how people are going to treat you just because you're a black man. And it's like, I'm, I'm trying to find the words to describe like how important what you're doing and raising awareness and trying to really make sure we raise, you know, our children, our son, our men are the right way because Nobody thinks about things from their perspective. Like we just accept it. Like that's just how you have to just accept yeah. it. Yeah. We're going to be scared yeah. of you. Yeah. And with having that lens in the back of your head, like people are going to be scared of me is so limiting. Except there's one part of that, that I think is, is a critical part. When, when a mom can explain to her son that for whatever reasons, society is going to be trying to fit you into this box. They're going to try to um, make you feel like this is the way you are. This is the way that you are going to behave. If a, if a child doesn't know that that's not true, they are not what society says, they do not have to follow those rules, then they will grow up to be very detached from what their own inner emotional world is. And that's where a lot of the problems come as the men get older. But even if that boy, even if he only has that one person, his, his mom or his, you know, whoever it is, even if he just has that one person that understands the challenges he is going to face and gives him that space to know that he doesn't have to conform. 
he like I, I understand it's the same thing you have to be safe but when you understand what the game is when you understand what the rules are then you can keep yourself safe but you don't lose yourself hmm. so what are some tips to navigate that it's and it's like a delicate balance would you say right yes it is it is but I, you know, like I think for, for us as adults as well, the more knowledge you have, the more aware you are of the situation, then the more possibilities you have to make it better. And when you're not aware, then you are probably perpetuating whatever the issue is. So what's the difficult part about it is this unconsciousness, this unconscious bias. And it, like there, there's quite a few um, experiments that have been done, research that has been done. And what I have found the most interesting is people often say when they realize, when they uncover this unconscious bias, just like I did with the fishing trip, they are shocked at themselves because they truly believed that they, they, they didn't have that bias. They didn't stereotype. So to, to be able to get in there takes a real openness and an awareness and, and a drive that uh, is hard to, to you know, get people to open up to. Once they do, then everything changes. But it's hard to, to get that foot in the door. Yeah. Yeah. The unconscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what methods do you use to help unlock that unconscious bias awareness well it's i've taken some of the same experiments that that i uh, that, that kind of opened my eyes to a, a bigger picture and and i've created some you know free materials to hopefully someone will grab them have a look go through it but there's one one of the most interesting and easiest ones. There's a, a simple experiment. And you so I would show you a portrait of a toddler. And that toddler, the clothes would be stereotypical female. And I would ask you to answer four or five questions very quickly off the top of your head. Like, what's a possible name for the child? Um, what are some hobbies the child might have? What are what might be her, the characteristics of the child? And what might be a future career profession for that child? I would show you a second portrait. And that portrait would show a, a toddler with typical male clothing on. And I would ask you the same questions. When that was over, I would have you, you know, look at your two answers and and share them. And then I would show you those two portraits again, and I would tell you it's the same child. So your answers are totally based on what you perceive the gender to be. And that, that one often helps people just start thinking, oh, there's, there's something there that maybe I need to look at a little bit deeper because it's so unconscious. Mm. That's really good. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. So where can people find the information like on the courses? Uh, everything is on my website. Uh, everything is there. I actually put a, um, a, I don't know if it's actually a link, maybe it's a link in the Kindle version, but in the book that uh, that I wrote, um, there is a, there's an address there, there is a gender bias quiz, I think it's called. I, I got permission from the publishers to put it in. So there's there's that too. But on the website, there is, um, there's a section that says free resources. And those mm -hmm. resources, you know, they will open the door. And all like, all you have to do, like, I don't understand sometimes why people don't grab, you know, uh, and just, but anyway, if they do, the only thing they have to do is they have to give me their email address. So it puts them on a newsletter that I send out weekly that is also about sharing information about raising boys. But 
they don't even need to look at a newsletter if they're not interested in that. They can unsubscribe and still get the free materials and just open that door to understanding a little bit more about the world of boys, the world of males. Mm -hmm. And that's on your sonhoodcoaching.com website, right? That's right. Yes, that's right. One thing I, I've noticed so far, it seems like your life is dedicated to serving. It is. Where did, where did that, so, so I guess, when did you realize that you wanted to have a life of service to others? Oh, I think it was always, I think that's just part of me. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really know what I wanted to do as far as, you know, what do you want to grow up and, and be? And uh, I questioned that for many, many years. But I always had this image of being kind of like a, uh, like a Joan of Arc or um, someone who stood up for a minority, whether it was a disadvantaged you know, group because of their gender or, or religion or whatever it is. But I always felt that would be me. And I think that's because that's exactly how my father was. And I saw him stand up. And I think that's it. That just became, you know, he, he's probably my biggest role model. Hmm. So tell me about your father. What was he like? Uh, he was a storyteller. He was, uh, he was a storyteller. He loved children and he would, he would entertain. Like we, our place was like, there were six children in our family and oh, wow. it was always, it was the place for the whole neighborhood to end up coming to our place. And he, he was just, he loved kids. He loved being around family. Family was really important, but he was also very, his, um, his morals were really high, but he didn't impose them. He shared them and he encouraged them, but it was always, you know, it was up to you what you wanted to do. But he, he really instilled very high morals, a very high work ethic. And he was just, um, he walked the talk. That's really nice. So you grew up in a very loving household. I had a very you? lovely childhood. Yeah. Yeah. And so there were six of you. So there's uh, six sisters. Uh, five sisters, one brother. Five sisters, one brother. Okay. And so what was the dynamic between, so I guess, because my brother, he's the baby. Mm -hmm. He was the baby. So was your brother, was he like, what, I guess, what was his position? He was number the, four. Sisters? Number four? He was number four. I was number three. But I was uh, really sick as a child, as um, that first year. I was really sick. And so um, I think in some ways he is like the, the first child, you know, in, in some ways. And my dad had, like, maybe like most men, I'm not sure, but he had wanted a boy. And he kept getting a girl and a girl and a girl. And um, so when he was born, I think there was a lot of celebration, really, because he was a boy and, you know, they wanted more children and, and they wanted uh, a balance or whatever. They wanted a boy as well as all the girls. Um, but he was also healthy. And I think, I think, I don't think that um, in that time period, in that generation, I don't think it was easy for men uh, maybe it's not now either but it was less easy less common for a man to really show his emotions he really was supposed to be stoic he was supposed to be the the disciplinarian and the you know head of the household the the money maker and you know i remember my dad saying to me after so now i was an adult and i had already left home and and um i used to write him a fair bit and at one point he wrote back to me and, and just opened up his heart completely and said that he used to see other 
fathers being able to, you know, really hug their children. And, and he said he wished that he had have been able to do that when we were all young, but that he was going to make sure, you know, next time I came home that there would be a big hug waiting for me. So it was like, I, I think my dad was a really, uh, I think he was very sensitive too, but he was, his, the expectations for him were very, very stereotypical expectations. So when he was raising a son, I think automatically some of those interfered with the, the bond and the connection that they could have had. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. So would you say you had a stronger relationship with your father than your brother did? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how did you see that impact your brother as you were growing up? I think he had more, like he had a lot of pressure. I think the expectations on him were like, they were, they were unrealistic. Like the, like he was supposed to, you know, be the athlete. He was supposed to be the, the star. Um, and he was, but I think because of the pressure, he never really felt that he was, you know, living up to my father's standards. Whereas my dad, you know, it might've looked that way, but intentionally he would never have done that. Like he was just, but it was complicated, their relationship because of it being between two males. Someone said to me just the other day, and I, and I thought about it afterwards because I hadn't really thought about it, but I had said the same thing, like little boys are born for their moms and little girls are born for their dads. And, you know, and I've said that enough times, and I certainly believe that both from my side with my father and for my side with my son. But the more I thought about it, I think it's because when a, a woman has a son, you aren't thinking, oh, she, that child's going to turn out like me. She's going to, I, I know what's going to happen. I, I know what's down the road for her. And, you know, and that can inhibit how we, how we parent. But when it's the opposite gender, it's like, okay, this is a new ball game. I can just kind of really be unconditional uh, because I don't have this other layer of expectations. So then it kind of made sense. Well, you know, that does make sense. Your father would treat you differently as his daughter than he would as his son. So that was, anyway, that was just something that seems to, that's another part that impacts how we relate to each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, it's like as you were speaking, I was thinking about the, the dynamics that we had growing up as kids. So I have um, two older sisters, one younger brother, and then um, a younger sister. So there's five of us total. Okay. And then my parents split when I was five, and so my brother was four. Um, and we grew up with my mom and we would, um, go to, so I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, so that we would go to New York, you know, whenever my dad would come pick us up and the way how my dad is, you know, he, he's a doctor and he really valued education, but my brother, I think probably had some learning difficulties, mm -hmm. learning something like that. Um, and so it's interesting because like from my dad's perspective, he's, he always thought that he treated all of us the same, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. but because my brother had a learning disability, um, if he didn't make, you know, good grades or if he got like a C's or if he got C's or anything like that, like he wouldn't basically, he wouldn't get allowance or something like that's how yeah. my dad would reward us. He would give us allowance if we got good grades. So it, it's interesting because like my dad thought he, he was treating us all the same way, but at the same time, it's like, there was that 
gap of like, you know, there's something going on with my brother, but you know, with the whole stoic thing and, and you know, the emotional, like that type of vulnerable conversation never happened. Yeah. But I think it's also important to remember in that generation, that wasn't the norm. So it's easy yeah. to look back, you know, with, with the norm that's today and look back and say, you know, well, why didn't they step up or why didn't they do this? And I think it's really important to remember that maybe was not an option at the time. Yeah. 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 And I know that's a big thing because, you know, there's the, the, the mindset, the, the sentimentality nowadays is way different than back then. Very much you know, so. <laughs> this was like the nineties, you yeah. know, and, but sometimes, you know, I, I, I see that it's hard um, to move forward, even though, you know, it was a different time. You get, he gets stuck with, you know, the, why not, why not this, why not that it should have been like this type of thing. So for, for people who struggle with, you know, wanting to move past that, what would you, what, what would you recommend? As a male, mm -hmm. well, there has to be a willingness to, to try to figure things out or make your world better. There has to be that willingness first for anything. But once you have that, like this is a, a really wonderful time to be doing those kinds of searches because you have unlimited access to a lot of different places. And I would say within the last five years, maybe even 10 years, there are more groups that are male focused, that are about providing these safe spaces. And I think that's what it is for most males to find that safe space, whether it's in a male group, whether it's with a counselor or a coach, but someone who has an understanding and a focus of what some of the issues that a male may have. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's how it all starts. And if, you know, if initially, if that's not your thing to, you know, kind of step out and, and speak about it, then again, there is a lot written. So you start doing the work yourself on, on self-improvement, self-development and self-awareness, and then you can take the next step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. So would you would would you say that the passion may have stemmed from seeing what your brother went through? I'm sure that I'm sure that that definitely influenced me having a soft spot for boys because I was the big sister. I was the next big sister. And so I felt it was my job to take care of him, which I did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how I felt too, of being my brother's mm -hmm. big sister, taking care yeah. of him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I want to learn more about Kathy and Catherine, <laughs> right? So I know that your life is dedicated to serving others, but what are the things that bring you joy? What are, what are, what are the things that make you happy? Um... It's relationships. So anything connected with my son or my husband, um, those, I mean, they can be challenging as well, but that's, that's where my, that's where my heart kind of stops and um, they are my world. I also get, like, it's funny you say the word joy because that's kind of something in the last four years of, you know, kind of being on this um, wheel of trying to do all of this. There were times that I felt overwhelmed and almost burdened. And, um, and I do a lot of self-development all the time. And one of the things I heard was when you're doing something that you do believe in, and, you know, you know, you should be doing it, that, decide if it's bringing you joy and if it's not bringing you joy and you can let it go, let it go. And 
if you can't let it go, then find a way to bring some joy into it. And so that's kind of as far as work goes, that's, that's kind of the, the mindset I've adapted around that. In my personal life, I get the most joy when I'm in nature. And so, and I'm living in a very um, beautiful area. And so, you know, I make sure I spend, you know, a couple of hours every day or every other day, just walking by the water or walking through the woods. And I listen to podcasts constantly. So that's, that's really my happy place. That's where, you know, I take care of myself. I'm finding there's a high correlation with people who enjoy spending time in nature, going for walks and everything, and that sense of self-awareness and self-development. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think like oh, almost all the people who are come on my podcast, they, they say the same thing, that they really enjoy being in nature and they, they really enjoy like, you know, me- meditating as well, you know, couple yeah. into that. Um, so, and I'm finding myself being that way as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. That's nice. I think when you're in nature, it just uh, awakens an awareness of the beauty of the world that you're living in, no matter yeah. how big or how small. And I think that is something it's easy to lose when you're just in the, the other part of the world. So I think that makes mm-hmm. a big difference for people's mental health and for their their outlook on life Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no definitely um it's so funny because before i started even paying attention and becoming so self-aware like i didn't pay attention to nature like that but now every single day when I go outside and I even just like look at the clouds. So I live in Florida, so it rains all the time, but we have like beautiful clouds, like mm, the colors yeah. in the sky, you know? So, I, you know, I'm not around mountains. Florida's really flat and I'm not around mountains or anything like that. But it's when I started paying attention to just nature and what I do have around me, even just yeah. the sky, it's like I noticed so much more things become more vibrant it looks so mm-hmm. beautiful and and that's like i i, t- I tell myself like we live in a paradise yeah. you know our nature is so beautiful um but it's like the thing that clouds vision is all the mental angst that a lot of people go through mm-hmm. you know i would say it puts like fog over your eyes so it makes it hard um to see what's in front of you and see how beautiful it is and so that's why I also really appreciate what you do. <laughs> I really appreciate what you do. Do you get a lot of pushback or, you know, negative comments from people or at all? Or or is what you do well received where you are in the world? Um, you know, people who are open minded and curious uh receive this really well and and really validate that yes this is an important thing to be doing people who aren't ready for that often interpret it as um not a threat but uh, almost a reflection on anything that they've done in the past that maybe doesn't align with what i'm talking about so those people might you know, push back a little bit. I remember um, I'd only kind of been going down this road for a couple of years and um, maybe, maybe not even two years. And I remember having a group of parents in that were in the same daycare that my son was in. And we decided to remove him from that daycare for numerous reasons. And I remember a group of parents coming up to me at our final, you know, farewell get together and telling me that I was really, uh, really a bad mother because I should be teaching my son to, you know, stick it out, like to, um, I shouldn't be so empathetic with the world that he is living in, that I should help him toughen up so that he survives. And, and it was kind of like, you know, if their opinion was more important to me, 
I might have really, you know, taken that in, but I was so gung ho and, and I was clear in how I wanted to have our son grow up. And, um, and so it didn't sway me, but it shocked me that that was so strongly ingrained. And they really were doing it out of kindness. They really thought they were helping this foreign mom who didn't quite understand the rules of society. And they were trying to help me as a mom raising a boy. So yeah, that that would be a little bit of pushback, I guess. Interesting. So they mm -hmm. said you need to toughen, make your son toughen up. Yep. Yeah. So help me help me understand that picture better. Like, I guess, how would you describe or I guess, I guess maybe getting into more details, like, what's an example of a parenting style that you had with your son versus what you saw other people doing? I had a focus on his emotional world. I had a focus on um, communication and connection. I guess those are the three biggest things. So, so it didn't, as long as I knew that he was well in his emotional world, then, you know, it didn't, it didn't phase me what other people thought or, or said. But if there was, if he was in an environment that was damaging his sense of self-esteem and his value as a human, and if I was not able to change that environment, then it was my responsibility to remove him from the environment. Mm -hmm. I am not going to allow my child to be in an environment where he's going to come out a little bit harder, a little bit um, more confused. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question. No, that's or not. interesting. No, I'm just like piquing my curiosity. It's really interesting. So, so I'm assuming he was being bullied or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and and again, like I, I have the experience. I, you know, I, I have the education. I know about working with children. I also knew a lot about that topic and I researched it even more. And I brought in everything that I understood about boys and, and the, the society, the societal rules and, and how that was damaging a lot of our boys. I brought all that in. I offered to, um, help implement some 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 you know s strategies to make the environment safer for all boys because because I didn't choose that particular educational setting lightly like I really did due diligence and I really believed it to have the potential to be you know a really good facility but because it went so against you know the the society's understanding I really kind of got blown off and it was kind of like, okay, this is, this is your problem, mama. You know, you're a foreign lady. This is not, you know, this is not the way we do it. We will listen to you, but we're not going to take any steps. And that's when I said, okay, well, see you mm. later. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's really, that's really, really interesting. Cause the other thing you said you valued is communication mm -hmm. and a lot of, things that people complain about especially as it relates to men is communication mm -hmm. but who's complaining about that it's the women, the women. that are complaining <laughs> but have women taken you know have they taken you know the the reins to understand what are truly the differences in the communication styles or do we blindly expect them to communicate the same way we do I think it's the blind expectation, just speaking I think so from too. personal experience. <laughs> yes, me too. Me too. But that's kind of, that's the whole thing too. Once you understand a little bit more about this, doesn't matter what age you are or whether you have your own children or you don't, we have males in our world. So the more that you understand it, then the more 
you know, your relationships with all of the males in your world, it changes and it becomes a little bit richer. And it's a, like we could live better together. I agree. I agree. I agree. And it's like, that's what's even more important about what you're doing, especially like with the communication piece. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'll, there's so many downstream effects of the type of skills and the type of emotional state and emotional development, mental development, communication development. It impacts how our society functions. And today, you know, so many women, they're like, oh, I can't find a guy, you know, oh, they complain so much. Yeah. I, I've seen, um, I've seen families be totally destroyed because of misunderstanding about communication. I had um, good friends, like really good friends, two children, um, just a beautiful family. Something, some trouble started. Um, they decided to take a bit of a, like a summer break separately. The, the woman said consistently, we're finished. The man consistently was saying, we can make this work. We can, we can do this. Finally, the man accepted what his wife was telling him and started to move on in another relationship. Mm. She had expected him not to take her words at face value, but to fight for her. She didn't think he was going to follow what she said. So it was just, it was kind of like they both still cared so deeply about each other and it didn't need to end the way it did. But yeah. because of that misunderstanding of communication, that, that changed, you know, the trajectory for that whole family. Wow. Yeah, that's so important. Mm -hmm. That's so important. You know, it between is. the dynamic I had with my brother and then getting married, it made me hyper aware of how I communicate mm -hmm. to men. Yeah. And even my girlfriend for advice or something, and I'm like, just be honest, tell the truth be direct of what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. And ask for <laughs> what you want. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because that's how I am at work too. I'm very direct, respectful. Yep. But I'm direct and I, I mean what I say. And, and I work in tech, which is a male dominated field. Yes. Yeah. And I see, I see that like, you know, a, a lot of, videos circulating on the internet, people complain about like how men in tech or treat women in tech type of thing. And my own subjective personal experience with working with engineers, developers and everything, they like working with me. Like I don't, I don't have a problem working with my engineers and my developers. Yeah. I had inherited a, like a, a project team. They were all burnt out engineers, developers, men didn't want to hear anything from anybody. Like didn't want to listen to anybody. I probably had the most difficult man to work with. And, but because I was direct and empathetic and communicated and heard his side as well. Yes. We became yeah. best friends, Yeah, you know, yeah. and he came through for me just because I, I, I gave him space to, to let out, the emotional baggage that he was dealing with and having like an empathetic ear and treating him like a person. So, so often we say they don't talk, but really how many times is it? We just don't know how to listen. Yeah. And we jump in and we keep talking and keep talking and keep talking, you know, until they finally shut down. But when, when we stop and listen, and, and really respectful, um, you know, magical things can happen with the, the dynamic of the relationship. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like for me, my own personal transformation. So um, I think I was heading towards like the, the t stereotypical, I'm a strong black woman. You have to listen to what I say, like type of thing. So that's how I was yeah. with my brother, mm -hmm. you know, and growing up, I was seeing, I'm like, okay, I can't treat him like that. I can't treat him like he has to listen to me or he has to do what I say. Like I can't. And then that, that mindset shift translated into how I started communicating with my husband mm -hmm. where I actually became softer. Right. So I stopped being so masculine. Cause I, I think I had developed uh, a more masculine role as a kid because my dad wasn't around. I had that same thought, mm -hmm. you need to be strong. Yeah. So I was tough. I was tough towards my brother. I was tough towards him. And, you know, I probably played a part in, in some of the struggles that he has today because of how I treated him and I, I considered him my, my best friend, you know? So it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. I, I, um, I would caution you to take too much responsibility because again, once you're aware of how affected, how damaging all of the things that happened, you know, to that little boy, like whether it was something his teacher said, or yeah. I just met a, a, a lovely young man about 40 years old, just a couple of days ago, first time meeting him. And he was just very open and, and we had this beautiful conversation. And he said that when he was five years old, he remembers clearly, but when he was five years old, he was uh, going to school in Singapore and he, he was something had happened on the playground. Uh, another child took his whatever, and he was crying and his teacher came over and told him clearly, stop crying. You're a boy clearly. So that that's maybe one of the wouldn't be the first but that would be one of the you know beginning messages that he got he said it took him four years of monthly um therapy sessions to get to that that was the root of his problem he had all kinds wow. of problems in his interpersonal relationships because he could not show his emotion he could not tap into that vulnerable part of him so it took him four years to, to get wow. back to, oh, shoot, that's where that happened. And so it's, you know, like, sense. so for your brother, I, and I know because of, you know, with, with my brother too, I know that, you know, the family dynamics affects all of us, but especially for, I would say, especially for boys the environment and now more than ever, like, I think it's a little bit worse for, for boys growing up, you know, in the last, in this generation, um, yeah. everything it's compounded and, and, uh, it makes it really tough for, for males. Yeah. 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 Wow. I'm just like thinking, yeah, you know, even what you said about the young man that you had the conversation with, right? Because my, with the, the way how my brother is, um, he'll take a lot, like, like from whoever is just, just in his life. And then he'll snap if, when it gets too much. Well, okay. I'll tell you another, one that just was a, a an eye opener for me. Um, my husband and I got married in Canada. It was a very, uh, it was kind of a weird situation anyway, but um, we, we were in Canada for two weeks. We spent a, a great deal of time with my sister and her husband. Like they drove us from one part of Canada to another part of Canada to get married and then back so we could fly <laughs> out. So we spent a lot of time with them. It was the first time that my husband met any of my family. And, um, and because of the different languages, you know, like he didn't speak English very well. And so, you know, it was, uh, it was quite a time. When we got back on the airport, uh, on the airplane to leave, I, 
I have uh, very, very intense issues about saying goodbye. I always have, mm. always will. I understand why now, but I didn't at the time. So we're leaving. I'm, I'm just broken saying goodbye to my sister and, and her husband, who's like a brother to me. And we're sitting on the plane and I am still uncontrollably sobbing. And I look over at my husband and he's just sitting there very stoically. And, and I, just, I looked at him and, and like, we're just starting our world together. And, and I looked at him and I just shook my head and I said, aren't you sad that we're leaving? Aren't you sad? And he said, yes. I said, well, why aren't you crying? And it was like I opened the floodgates. And, and he was sobbing just as much because I gave him permission. And I think, you know, because we're from two different cultures, it was like the permission to say, it's okay here in my culture to do this with me. But it was an eye opener just to, to give permission to express your, what you're really feeling. It, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. Wow. Yeah, giving permission to express yourself. I don't think my brother ever had it. Yeah, I don't think my brother ever had that. M many I men he ever haven't. Had yeah. 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 Hmm. This is very eye-opening for me, by the way, like, I'm glad. I'm really glad yeah. because, you know, it's like changing the world one person at a time. It's true because there's a ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The one, what, but in your story, when you were men mentioning about um, struggling to say goodbye. So that's something that I kind of have a thing with too, not as to the same degree. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but I, I noticed like, like for myself, um, like it's hard for me to hang up first. Like if, if I'm on the phone with someone like, okay. or, you know, or, um, I don't know, I guess it's like, the, like, like I'm enjoying the connection so much. It's like, it's hard for me to like, like click off and end it so fast. So what did you find on your journey that I guess you, that was your aha for why you were struggling with the goodbyes? Um, so I mentioned when I was uh, a baby, I was very sick and I was hospitalized for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months. And, um, my parents really thought that like they took me out without permission because they thought I was going to die. Like I was, I was uh, not thriving. And in the hospital at that time, which is again, okay, comes back to remembering at the time what the rules were at that time. Um, only one parent could come in to see me. I had a, a skin disease and so I was, um, they actually ha had uh, tied my little hands to the crib bedsides so I wouldn't scratch myself more wow. and had a heat light kind of on me. And my mom was not allowed to touch me. She could come in, but she couldn't touch me. So. So I've done a lot of trying to understand where this uh, thing of, you know, having so much difficulty with goodbyes. And to me, what I have come to realize and, and think, yeah, this is probably what it is. It's just, it's an ab abandonment issue. Even though it wasn't, I wasn't abandoned, but I was. I was an infant. I lost my prime caregivers. I, um, so that's always whenever there is some separation, I struggle 
But at least now I know it. So now I can say, you know, when I'm saying goodbye to my son or something, okay, you know, I'm going to do this. It'll take me a day to come back, but I'll come back. But that's where, for me, that's where it originates. Oh, wow. Okay. That, okay. 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 Thank you for sharing. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, when I was growing up, uh, my parents had shipped me down to Florida when I was like one or something like that. And I was with my, my, my grandmother, my aunt <laughs> for like a yeah. year or something. So it was like my infant years. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was the thing. I'm like, why can't I, like, I can't end conversations sometimes. Like I just linger and hold on, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do do a little bit of research on, you know, people who have issues with abandonment and how it shows up in their adult life and and uh it'll give you more information to go with. Oh, thank you. I love this conversation so much. Yeah, like it 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 was very very insightful. I learned so much. Like well, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad. happy we connected. Yeah. So am I. I always think yeah. that there's a uh like it's not by coincidence, like anybody who does reach out or anyone that I reach out to and we do connect, there's always a reason for it. And sometimes I don't know why until we start talking. And then it's kind of like, like podcasts have just been incredible. I have met the most incredible people ever. I'm truly same. blessed. Yeah. Same, 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 same. It's, and, and I, I got the idea to start one up um, last year, last year, and I recording in November, and I launched this year, February. Okay. Yes. So I'm new. I'm new to the whole world of podcasting, but I don't know. It's just been really accelerating my life in ways that I didn't expect at all. Yeah. Well, that's my next project that last week, um, someone was coaching me and I've been thinking about it also for a while, you know, creating a space for a safe space for moms. Eventually, I would also like to do one that is just for males, mm -hmm. just to come up and talk. Yeah, you should do it. Go for it. I will. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> one, at a, one at a time, but yes. One at a time. Mm -hmm. I am. Yeah, you have the mic and everything, you know. <laughs> yes, that was the that was the instigator. Okay, you got a mic now. You got to do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's the hardest. Oh, I mean, I think yeah. you have a great setup. You could literally record one tomorrow if you wanted to, and I could I could refer you my video guy. So <laughs> he's in the Philippines. So you guys are actually in the same time zone. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a new yeah. world. It's just opening up. I'm exploring it a little bit before I jump full full fledged in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you need any advice or anything, let me know and I'll, I'll give you all the tips I have with how, how I got started. Thank um, you, Jessica. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as we're wrapping up, I guess, what, what would be your thought, your top three pieces of advice for moms or parents that are raising young boys or parents that may have, you know, trouble with their male teenagers or Anything in that realm, what would be your top three pieces of advice? Uh, the first would, uh, would be to find ways to become aware of what you don't know. So do, do that, um, jump in and start doing a little bit of research to understand what you don't know, understand what the, the situation is. Once you have the awareness, then take a deep dive into all the knowledge that you can acquire so that you're better equipped for your own understanding and then also to be able to help your your son and then just be an advocate like stand up for him like make make a stand at school make a stand with that parent who is making your son feel like you know he's going to hurt that little girl where she's probably more apt to slug him than than he is so be aware, get more knowledge, be an advocate for your son. And where can people find you? 
Best place is my website, sunhoodcoaching.com. There's everything is there. All the social connections are there. Um, the free resources are there. A link to my book is there. Everything, that's the best place to start. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.